morning to our esteemed, to our esteemed guests, colleagues, and presenters. I'm Professor Darren Subramanian. I am the academic leader at the School of Social Legal Studies at the School of Law on the Peter Maritzburg campus. It gives me great pleasure this morning on behalf of the Deputy Vice Chancellor and Head of the College of Law and Management Studies at the University of KwaZulu-Natal to welcome you to the webinar under the title, Enhancing Productivity and Safeguarding Confidentiality in Ombuds Institutions, as well as leveraging Grammarly and Chat, and chat GPT for quality investigation reports. We are all looking forward to a very interesting discussion. I would like to wish our colleagues and speakers all the very best this morning. And I sincerely hope that you enjoy the presentation and, and the discussion that follows. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure to welcome our, our public protector, Advocate Galeka. Thank you very much and enjoy the session. As we wait for Advocate Kuleka to join our session, I'm just going to extend my welcome. My name is Aliki Echkim. I'm also from the School of Law at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and I'm going to be facilitating our discussion today. And um, I want to also uh, add my uh, welcome to that of Professor Darren, and really just uh, to touch on some of the wonderful guests that we have today and the sessions that you're going to enjoy this morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. We know that uh, today is going to be translated into various languages. And so really, this is a chance for us to be a global community. Now, if you're involved in ombudsman work, you know already that uh, putting together quality and reliable reports in an efficient way is part of the deal. And being able to harness technology to achieve these goals is vital. And that's what today's session is all about. We're going to be looking at two fantastic tools, Grammarly and ChatGPT. And we have experts who are going to be taking us through these tools and how we can implement them in report writing. But more than that, we are also concerned with uh, confidentiality. And so we are going to be touching on this as well. So we are going to be uh, having three speakers today. Our first speaker is from um, the University of Kuzuna Natal. Uh, she is the acting director of the Maritime Law and Maritime Studies at the university. That is Dr. Uh, Dr. Dusty Donnelly. And I have the privilege of working with her. Uh, she is seasoned in digital technology and actually actively leads initiatives to integrate technology into teaching practices at the School of Law. And she also, her focus area in law is AI and data protection. So she really is the right person to be speaking on this very important topic. We also are joined by Mr. Mark Brand, who is a senior lecturer in applied technologies at the Nelson Mandela University. And he's going to be looking at ChatGPT and how that can improve productivity at the Ombudsman institutions. And finally, but definitely not least, we have the Honorable Gabriel Savino, who is going to be joining us um, to speak very importantly on um, the confidentiality and mitigating data protection breaches as we use these technologies. He is from uh, Santa Fe, Argentina. So those that's our very exciting lineup. And we are just going to uh, wait for our um, uh, for Advocate Kuleka to join our meeting to uh, kick it off. Um, I'm just going to wait for Frankie to let me know whether she has joined us. Yes, yes, she has joined us. She has joined us. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Over to you, Advocate Kuleka. Very good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much. Um, 
allow me on behalf of the AO board uh, to, to greet you this morning. Um, I wish to observe our facilitator, uh, Ms. Aliki Echkumbe from the UKZN Law School. Our speakers this morning, our ombudsman uh, and a fellow friend and colleague uh, of Santa Fe in Argentina, um, the, the director of the Maritime Law uh, and Maritime Studies, UKZN, and, and the senior lecturer from Nelson Mandela University. Without a doubt, I think this is such a wealthy knowledge um, that we are going to be presented with um, on this morning, discussing this uh, essential and evolving topic, uh, not just in the lives of ombudsmanship, but in the lives of people of the world and people of the globe, really. Uh, and for us as ombudsmen, coming from ancient years of the Swedish, who established this kind of institution, I cannot imagine that they had thought that there would come a time when ombudsmanship and its investigations is uh, imagined in this manner. And I think it is an honor and a privilege for us as ombudsmen of today to be able to interact um, with this topic and, and learning it from scholars uh, in the field you know, on how do we interact with it. And I really hope that colleagues, not just in Africa, but around the world, have actually joined in numbers um, to listen on how do we navigate the evolving atmosphere and environment within which we perform such critical tasks for our respective countries. Now, society has gained knowledge about the concept of fairness, by learning from wise men and women and scholars alike, this wisdom germinated in the form of parables, anecdotes, and stories that have withstood the test of time. Just like the Bhagavad Gita and the Ramayana, Confucius, Aristotle, and King Solomon have taught countless men and women from various backgrounds how to lead life from birth to death justifiably and fairly, these have been centered concepts. While these figures and their teachings originate from different cultural and philosophical backgrounds, they share common themes related to ethical conduct, justice, and the pursuit of a virtuous life. The lessons from these figures continue to resonate with individuals seeking principles for leading a just and fair life. In the context of the ombudsman, the concept of fairness finds application in the strong moral principles and social responsibility that institutes the ethical and moral values that are critical for the requirements of impartiality and fairness that serve as the operational foundation of the ombudsman as an institution. These and other personal competencies are fundamental aspects of the identity of ombudsman and underpins the trust relationship between members of the public who are our complainants and the institution of ombuds. Trust in the institution of the ombudsman is based on a number of things, including but not limited to the belief that ombudsmen and staff have the right skills and expertise required to assist the complainant of the member of the public, and it is also the right motivation to do so. However, it has to be aligned with the evolving times that we find ourselves in, so that we are each time equal to the task better to serve, serve as pillars within our respective countries. Experts note that vulnerability is a fundamental characteristic of a trust relationship. The person placing trust in another knows that and accepts that this trusted person can decisively influence the outcome of their entrusted action. Trust relationships involve a degree of uncertainty that cannot be mitigated. It is only the belief in the trusted person's abilities and goodwill that justifies taking on the risk of this uncertainty. 
seeing how we as ombudsmen have been shaped in our work by history, humanity, and experiences of humans, recent advances in the generative artificial intelligence may have widespread implications, and the introduction thereof to ombuds institution in, involves a thoughtful approach that takes into consideration the unique needs, culture, and workflows of the institution. Let me just also take this opportunity to announce that Public Protector South Africa has actually won the award of innovation in the public sector in South Africa through the introduction of its integrated case management system. So we too are flowing in this direction. Now looking into chat GPT, a generative artificial intelligence developed by open artificial intelligence designed to generate human-like text based on the input it receives was quick to break records when it was launched on the 30th of November, 2022. It reached 1,000, 100 million rather, monthly active users within just two months, making it the fastest growing consumer application in history. The platform now has more than 180 million active users who use it for personal and work-related purposes in organizations around the world. While it offers immense value and time-saving capabilities, particularly to organizations wanting to leverage its capabilities to optimize tasks, it is a tool that requires careful handling to minimize the risks that come with this technology particularly in a world where we find that our institutions are transforming to attract much younger personnel. We know how those leverage around technology. The emergence of powerful generative artificial intelligence technologies reintroduces a host of classic questions in a new context. Automation technologies, by definition, perform specific tasks in place of humans. This technology processes large amounts of data in ways that humans cannot. Basically, the core goal of artificial intelligence development is for computers to be able to recognize patterns, make decisions, and judge, just like humans. During the course of this webinar, you will also hear how the integration of artificial intelligence tools can enhance the productivity of the ombudsman in various ways, which in my view can improve the overall efficiency of our organizations, including in areas such as documents quality, ensuring that the written communication reports and documentation are grammatically correct, enhancing the overall quality and professionalism of the content. Communication enhances and formulating responses to inquiries or complaints in a clear and concise manner, and also speedily. Consistency helps maintain consistency in writing style and language across different documents, creating a unified and professional image of the ombudsman institution. Data analysis, artificial intelligence tools can assist in analyzing large contents of textual data, helping ombudsman institutions identifying patterns, trends, and areas of complaint of concern in complaints and inquiries. Automation of routine tasks. While these tools can enhance productivity, it's important to use them judiciously and complement their capabilities with human expertise, especially in the context of the sometimes incredible, sensitive and complex matters handled by ombudsman institutions, but also considering the diversity in areas that we serve, such as my country, South Africa, where the majority majority are still the rural and the illiterate, and particularly those who are who come to seek assistance from, from the ombuds. While digitization, embracing the fourth industrial revolution and technological advancements generally are things I advocate for and apply in my own environment, as I've already alluded, it is important for us to be mindful at all times that there must be a balance between the positive and negative aspects of this rise, which ultimately depends on human decision making. Human choices are the ones to determine what will prevail. But it is also important that as we embark on this transformation, we also ensure that the decisions we make in this line of work is secure. Therefore, it is also important for us also in future to look at how do we govern the cyber and its security as ombudsman. 
I thank you and I wish you all of the best in your deliberations on this crucial aspect of your work. I really wish that I could have stayed throughout uh, this program, but I will not be able to do so due to other commitments, but I will definitely listen in for as long as I can, as this is much beneficial to me as it is to you. All of the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Advocate, for those wise words. And in particular, I loved that idea of actually the wisdom that has been passed down. And really, when we're looking at this kind of technology, we have great power and, as you alluded to, great responsibility in our use of it. And so wisdom is needed in how to make the best use of this technology within the particular context of report writing for the Ombudsman. So thank you very much for your time. We greatly appreciate it. And now I'm going to be handing over to our first speaker, who's going to be uh, explaining how we can best use Grammarly, a fantastic tool in report writing. Just to introduce her in a little bit more depth than I did earlier, we've got Dr. Dusty Donnelly, who's an admitted advocate uh, of the High Court of South Africa and is a senior lecturer at the School of Law at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Her research is focused on artificial intelligence and data protection law and regulation, and she has a wealth of expertise in digital technology. Uh, she actively leads initiatives to integrate technology into teaching practice at the School of Law, uh, where she trains staff on the effective utilization of digital technologies. So uh, over to Dusty, thank you very much. We look forward to what you have to say. Thank you very much, Aliki. And thank you very much to the African Ombudsman Research Center for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, although we don't have access to a poll, I hope that the attendees do have access to the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. Um, could we just check that and um, perhaps uh, if you have access to that, just give us a little um, reaction uh, so I can see. Right, great. So what I want to do, um, since we haven't enabled poll on this Zoom meeting, is get an indication from those present who uses Grammarly um, at present within their work. Um, and to make it simple, let's just say that um, if you've used Grammarly and you like it, use the little heart button. If you haven't, or the thumbs up. Um, and if you haven't uh, used it at all and you can find the thumbs down, perhaps give us a thumbs down and pop in the chat some of the questions you have, some of the concerns, some of the reasons you might not already be using this product. Um, and also please, whatever questions you have about what you want to know um, about it. So quite a few people already using Grammarly. Um, I am going to hopefully show you a few new things this morning. Um, let's just click on share screen. Um, but there will be time for questions at the end. Right. So I was asked to speak to you today about leveraging Grammarly for enhanced productivity in ombudsman institutions. Um, my slideshow doesn't talk to privacy issues, but of course, since Grammarly is based in the US and will be transferring your data to the United States, that is an important conversation, and we can always talk about that in the Q&A session. Um, but let's begin by looking at um, what Grammarly can do. I mean, it can be a very powerful transformative tool for enhancing productivity in organizations. And what we're going to specifically explore today is its application across the various functions in the ombudsman sector, um, particularly focusing on investigation reports. So, AORC, uh, thank you so much for convening today's um, webinar. Um, I think that what AORC particularly um, emphasizes is um, in, in organizing today's webinar is the importance in, in this work that you do of effective communication. 
across all functions, uh, training, research, advocacy, and investigation reports. In all of those contexts, communication, which is far more than just spelling check, is vital. One has to be able to reach the target audience with clear, effective communication that brings across the message in the most powerful way. And this is where Grammarly really is far more advanced than any kind of spell checker that you may have become used to using. And you need to begin thinking about Grammarly as your digital writing assistant. Um, so if I look at AORC's functions, um, Grammarly has a range of applications across all of those functions. So if we look at promoting the study of ombudsman activities, whoops, what's happened to my slideshow here? One second. Here we go. As I said, Grammarly ensures clear communication. I'll show you in a minute how it provides suggestions on clarity and tone. And when you get those aspects right, the reader absorbs a much deeper understanding of what you're trying to convey about the particular obligations or problems that are being experienced. Training seminars and short courses, again, clear communication, well-structured, error-free training materials are vital to enhance the whole learning experience for participants. And when we talk about working in committees, Grammarly does have a feature for collaborative writing, which becomes incredibly useful. Um, and it can ensure not just accuracy, but consistency in our outputs where we have multiple authors and we want to ensure that we present a document that conveys a single tone or a single um, brand. Grammarly's collaborative writing tools become really useful. Um, and when we talk about publishing papers, journals, et cetera, proofreading, as we all know, is essential, not just um, for quality, but also for the impact of that message. Um, I've mentioned already the communication strategy. I'll share that in a minute when I talk about some of the features that Grammarly Business offers. These would need to be set up within your particular organization by your IT administrator. Um, some of them you'll see we do not have set up at UKZN, but you can create um, an organizational brand and you can create certain organizational standards which ensure that everybody writing communication messages and reports within your organization communicate uh, using the same um, terminology, the same branding. So um, as you can see, Grammarly is going to, in essence, ensure that everything you produce comes across as very polished, very compelling. Um, and so what I'm going to share on the screen are a couple of screenshots around how it would work. For many of you, this will look familiar, but those of you who've never used it, it might look a little bit overwhelming. Once you've um, created your document, whether you've got the Grammarly web e editor open and you're using um, your document um, in the Grammarly web editor, or you're using MS Word and you've installed Grammarly as a plugin, to work within MS Word as your spell and grammar checker. When you come to looking at your document, whoops, you will see that it will be covered in colorful lines. There will be red lines, which are spelling errors, and there will be different colors. Uh, let me just move my block out the way. Blue is clarity. Uh, green is engagement. And then Purple is the tone or the delivery dial that you're aiming for. And of course, working through it like a spell checker um, is very easy. One can accept all um, to correct misspellings throughout the document in one go. Uh, you can bin suggestions if you don't want to accept them and uh, move through your document quite swiftly. What you might also notice at the bottom and I am just looking for my PowerPoint pointer, but I can't find it. So look in the bottom right of the screen. You'll also see the little plagiarism 
block. So for those of you who work in an academic space, you may be familiar with Turnitin. Um, but when you're producing journal articles or reports that need to be referenced to literature, it's essential to ensure that there is no plagiarism and Grammarly has that built-in plagiarism checker, which works very effectively. The next thing that many people don't know about Grammarly is that you can suggest, you can set up tailored goals for each document. So when you're in the Grammarly web editor on the right hand side of the screen, you would have seen, if you look um, under the assistant, you'll see the little goals block and it'll bring this big goals pop up up onto your screen. And this is something that really does make a big difference in um, writing across different domains. So if you were writing emails, you could set it on email or on general, as I have done. If you were writing um, something that might be more of a marketing um, or um, a short um, informational poster, you might prefer to, to click casual or creative. And then you could uh, look at the intent of the document. Is it to inform your reader? Is it to describe facts? But if you were doing something more creative, you could instruct Grammarly that you're really trying to tell a story. And it will then, using its AI algorithms, make style, engagement, clarity, and delivery suggestions based on these goals. It's also very important to always select the audience and formality for the document. So for example, um, if you're writing an academic piece, one would pick an expert audience and formal language. If you're writing um, a report, it might be appropriate to uh, select a knowledgeable audience, but keep the formality neutral, not overly formal, but certainly not informal. And if you were writing for a less educated audience where it needs to be readable and understandable, you could pick general and you could pick um, an informal tone. And so these things really do make a difference in terms of enhancing how valuable Grammarly's suggestions are. The third thing many people don't know, and it's proved to be invaluable for colleagues of mine who are second language English speakers and students of mine who perhaps are Afrikaans speaking, Isizulu speaking, French speaking. Um, Grammarly has a number of different languages programmed into its AI algorithms. And so if your primary language is not English and you were to select, for example, Isizulu, Grammarly will be able to detect in your writing some of the typical um, grammatical lapses that might um, make your document look a little less polished if you do have to present it in British English. You can change this as well, of course, to any language that you like um, or to US English. And when you turn on fluency assistance, you will see that Grammarly will begin to provide you with suggestions um, and to actively look through your writing for um, errors in fluency that might be tripping you up as a second language speaker. Now we get to some of the features that your organization and managers within the organization would need to think about carefully. And that is setting up a style guide for your particular ombuds office, because these rules have to be assigned by the IT administrator for your organization. You can't go in and change them, but you'll see that what it would allow your organization to do would be to set up standard terms. So for example, if your ombuds organization should always be presented or if the AORC should always be presented with capitalization of A, R, O, and C in the name, you can specify that as a style rule and everyone in the organization will then automatically have their writing corrected to implement that rule. Um, so it's a very useful feature and it comes along with, if you look on the left-hand side, other features like brand tones, which um, may also be useful um, for your organization. Lastly, 
Grammarly has a feature to create snippets. And this is really useful as a shortcut. So it can really speed up your writing if you have certain paragraphs that routinely feature in a particular report, or you have a signature line that you want to create to sign off on a particular document. Of course, you can create, for example, an email signature in Outlook, and you wouldn't need to use this. But if a Word document or report needs to end with your organization's logo, you can insert that using the picture function. Link to your organization's website, you can insert that hyperlink. You can insert the signature as um, a PDF image and all of the details. And so you could simply um, tap signature and the snippet would then auto populate in exactly the same way each time. Lastly, once you've finished um, your document, you can use Grammarly's review function to check your overall score. So if you're in the web editor, as you see on the right hand side of your screen under the assistant, you'll see that my document got a 60 out of a possible 100. And Grammarly will provide you with um, some feedback. Although I don't use this, um, and I don't think many of your seasoned investigators would need to use this, I am showing it to you because it's a very useful tool when you're mentoring interns and junior members of staff to occasionally review a draft that they've presented to you and to go over the word count and readability of the document. So moving on to investigation reports. Um, there are a couple of key features to recap where I would certainly see a role for Grammarly being integrated across uh, your organization. The first is, of course, to ensure clarity and consistency, and um, particularly important to use Grammarly's clarity and engagement suggestions to make sure that the report is readable and isn't going to be misunderstood or misinterpreted. Of course, error-free writing is essential and nothing creates an unprofessional tone and distraction for the reader more than frequent typos, and Grammarly fixes those very quickly at the click of a button. Um, but writing style enhancement, so the suggestions that Grammarly will make, particularly useful in things like redundant phrases or repetitive writing that um, creates a complete lack of interest for the reader because it's simply too um, too repetitive, uses too many of the same phrases over and over again. Grammarly picks those up and creates a much more engaging and accessible report. Um, time efficiency is a given. There's just not enough time in any day. So the fact that Grammarly is quite a speedy um, spelling and grammar checker and allows you to correct multiple errors at once. So all errors in the same category, you can just click correct all and it will be done at the touch of a button. Really does enable you to focus on substance. I'm sure that the next speaker will delve even deeper into that when we get to chat GPT, um, which is a very exciting tool um, and can also be used together with this. Professional tone um, Grammarly is very good at tone suggestions and at ensuring um, that it makes suggestions for how to rephrase sentences in a way that might uh, be needed to create that impartiality that is essential um, for any work in this area. So um, as I've mentioned already, uh, the assistant um, can deal with um, terms and jargon that need to be standardized in your reports. It can be used um, on a collaboration where you invite other members of your organization to collaborate on the same document. That's very useful where you may have previously found two or three people create different sections of a document and then it's obvious that it's been written by three different people who have slightly different styles of writing. Grammarly's collaborative feature enables you to create one seamless document that has um, a unified um, 
style through art. Just get back into my PowerPoint. Um, as I said, Grammarly's AI tool analyzes your sentence structure to avoid overly long sentences, redundancy, um, overuse of common words to improve the readability. And you can customize it as I've showed you. There also, as there would be in any spell checker, customizable dictionaries um, and a customizable institutional style guide. Um, so the last point would just be that you could, for example, within your organization, use Grammarly's Insights feature. Um, I've showed you how it um, assesses the readability of each individual document. What I haven't showed you, but which is visible on the Grammarly dashboard, would be insights across a um, particular time frame, a week, month, six months, of how um, an individual's writing has progressed in terms of readability. And this is a useful tool, again, for encouraging continuous improvement. So in closing, um, I hope that you've enjoyed this very brief introduction to the multifaceted features of Grammarly um, and how it might benefit um, aspects of your work as an ombud. Um, Whoops, again, the PowerPoint disappeared. I really do encourage you to integrate it into your daily workflow. Um, I find that the Grammarly plugin for Word is particularly useful. Unfortunately, the Grammarly plugin for Outlook doesn't work um, seamlessly anymore, but I'm sure that Microsoft and Grammarly will work out their fight. Um, there were concerns at one stage that Grammarly was not private. And of course, in an ombudsman scenario, that's a huge issue because you're dealing with highly sensitive reports. Um, it is encouraging to see that Grammarly have improved their privacy policy. But of course, your text does need to be analyzed by their software, which means that your text is being processed by Grammarly and that does involve a cross-border data transfer because the processing is happening in the United States. They don't have stringent privacy laws like we do. But if you read Grammarly's privacy policy, you will see that they do have standard contractual clauses and um, institutional policies in place that make them compliant both with HIPAA, which is the Health Information Portability Act in the US, and with the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation in the EU. That's great news. What's not great news is that if you live in the GDPR or the UK, there's an easily accessible um, regulator uh, or information officer rather that you can contact to report concerns or to exercise your data subject rights. If, for example, you want to know where your data has been stored, which third parties, service providers may have had access to it, or you want to delete your data. They don't currently offer, um, at least on their website, a single point of contact for countries in Africa. Um, in fact, they don't mention Africa at all. So um, this is something for your IT department and management to think about carefully when you set up your account. Um, from my side, if you read their privacy policy, um, you will see that they have a number of security features in place. No one at Grammarly reads your document. Their AI software processes it through their algorithms. They don't um, allow anyone to have access to your document. Um, and they do allow you to delete all your data if you delete your account. But that is certainly something to think about. I've probably reached my time. I can yes. see a leaky smiling at me, so I'll stop. <laughs> I am at the end. Thank you, Thank you so much. much, everybody. Thank you so much, Desi. And I'm sure that we can pick up a number of those points in the discussion at the end, especially when it comes to confidentiality, which our final speaker will pick up on. Um, but I think that you have highlighted the power of this tool and how it can definitely be used effectively by the inputs. So thank you very much for that. And we are now going to be moving on to our next speaker. So um, things are going to be heating up. If you thought uh, Grammarly was a fantastic tool, well, welcome to ChatGPT. And if you haven't made use of this yet and played around with it, 
uh, where have you been in 2023? Hopefully today will be the day where you really get uh, to play with uh, ChatGPT and see how it can help you as an ombuds. Um, this task is going to be handed over to Mr. Mark Brand. And just to do a little introduction uh, for him, he is a senior lecturer in applied technologies at the Nelson Mandela University. But he has a very diverse interest and has done many um, different things in his life, including uh, bearing, being part of a touring rock band, um, an IT trainer, a fence salesman, a sound engineer. So we have a jack of all trades in the room that's going to be telling us uh, much more about how we can use ChatGPT in our context to be able to improve efficiency, and uh, be able to enhance our report writing. So um, Mark, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aliki. Good morning to everybody and uh, my sincere thanks for the honor for being invited to address you. Uh, I just want to make sure, uh, Aliki, a thumbs up if you have audio from me. All good? Yes, thank you very much. All right, so we're leveraging ChatGPT to improve productivity in ombudsman institutions. And I have so much to say and so little time, so forgive me, I'm going to move fast. Aliki's going to stop me when I move too fast. I will make some brief remarks about how we got here, followed by a necessarily brief introduction to ChatGPT. And thereafter, I'd like to share the key insight that distinguishes highly productive use of ChatGPT from other more mundane uses. And I will then provide some examples that will build on this insight before returning to some closing remarks about the wider context in which all of this is embedded. So let's go. The name oh, ChatGPT. You're, you're really going too fast. You're really going too fast. <laughs> <laughs> Slow it down. The name ChatGPT refers to two separate technologies, right? Chat refers to chatbot. Uh, that's a kind of computer program that simulates back and forth conversations. And a chap called Alan Turing first uh, speculated about these kinds of programs in the 1950s, but we didn't see them until 1965, a famous program called ELISA. But for since for 50 years, basically, those programs were built by compiling very explicit rules. And we don't do things in that way anymore. This is just a little bit of background to kind of lead us in. GPT, the second part of the equation, stands for generative pre-trained transformer, a data processing model that only existed as separate parts until 2018. An obscure company called OpenAI put them together and GPT-1 was born. They followed with GPT-2 in 2019 and GPT-3 in 2020. And across the world, there was only a handful of programmers that were really paying much attention. Just a year ago, on 30th of November, they publicly, re publicly released ChatGPT, a chatbot powered by their GPT 3.5 model. And the world has not been the same since. So we don't have time this morning to reflect comprehensively on how we got here. Mine is to speedily assist you with insights and advice about how you might leverage ChatGPT to enhance your report writing activities. I'd like to assume that many, if not most of you, have at least some familiarity with ChatGPT already, but it might be prudent just to speed run, sorry Aliki, through some of the basics in order to make sure that we're all working from a common base. So let's take a quick look at ChatGPT. Right, this is what it looks like. We take ourselves to the website chat.openai.com, and after a couple of preliminaries, we end up here. Fine, we'll be back there in a second. <clears throat> So the primary way of interacting with ChatGPT is by visiting its website. I'm going to keep this simple by ignoring the range of alternative options, including OpenAI's official mobile applications. There's more to be said about that to fully appreciate the implications of using one of those apps. The ChatGPT website requires a simple one-time registration, whereupon you will have your own username and password with which you'll immediately gain access. You will soon notice there's an option to upgrade to a paid service, about which I'll make some more brief comments at the end. Today, I'll just be focusing on what the free service can do for you. The chat interface should be familiar enough to anyone who uses WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Telegram, or even SMS. You type your message, you send it, 
and a reasonably prompt reply returns. The difference, of course, is that your reply is entirely computer generated rather than being the response of any real person. Right, so let's go back to ChatGPT and well, what have we got here? We have a chat interface um, and I can type something in the bottom. Let's say, hello, that seems a good place to start. I guess I can give it one O. Here we go, hello. That's friendly enough. It says, what can we do for you today? So um, how about, how are you? I, I don't know what to ask it right now. I have nothing on my mind. And I ask it, how are you? And it says, it's just a computer program. It has no feelings. So we're already getting into murky territory. We have nothing really interesting to ask it right now. Um, I, I wonder if it can maybe help me out with lotto numbers, perhaps. Now, I want you to see the kind of engagement that I'm having with it here. Perhaps it's sort of reminiscent of um, maybe what one might have uh, done with Google. Is it like Google? Well, not exactly. The, the logical step is to use it like a human version of Google. Rather than typing in keywords, you might, uh, and then get pages and pages of results to trawl through. There is an appeal in being able to ask a question and receive just one response, which directly addresses the question. Of late, Google and Bing have recognized this preference by incorporating AI responses into their own search engine interfaces, along with traditional search index results. In this sense then, using ChatGPT in this way adds little value to what is becoming standard fare for any search engine. And this brings me to where I'd actually like to start. You see, the term artificial intelligence is really quite unfortunate, since it brings with it all kind of ethical baggage. In fact, artificial intelligence isn't intelligent at all. The term large language model is a far better description of what we're actually dealing with. A large language model, or LLM, is a highly detailed statistical model describing the way words are typically combi combined to construct meaningful sentences. An LLM is produced by applying, applying machine learning techniques to an extraordinarily large collection of examples, producing what amounts to an extremely complex map of associations. So let's demonstrate. As a thought exercise, let's just stare at that sentence. I wonder if you've completed it yet. Let's see what ChatGPT says. What are we expecting? I hope that's not terribly surprising. But what is more surprising is that ChatGPT has any conception of the cat sat on the mat. Why would it say that? Is it because it rhymes? What's actually going on here? Um, another example, how about uh, the quick brown Fox, uh, perhaps you've, uh, you are familiar with the continuation, the logical continuation for this. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Where does that come from? Well, that's, of course, something that is commonly used to uh, test all the keys on a keyboard. How about this one? And, and for this one, I'm going, well, let's, let's go in. Uh, it was a dark and stormy night. Sorry, night. Mark, what should happen? I... If you're a reader of the Snoopy comics, I think you know what's coming next. Mark, are you able Look at to that. share your screen with us? Beg your pardon. To... Is there a comment? Sorry, Mark. Are you able to share your screen with us? My goodness. I'm no. sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, why did that not share? No, that's not right. Aliki, do you have a screen now? Uh, no, not yet. Not yet. Oh, there we go. It's there. It's it. That's it. Oh, You're there. Okay. Um, would you like me just to continue from this point? Yes. No, no. You were very Absolutely. entertaining and we were able to okay. follow you. Right, so we, we have ChatGPT. I apologize for those who have not seen ChatGPT yet, but I've been having a couple of conversations with it, as you can see, and uh, we asked it to complete the cat set on the, and it told us Matt. Um, right, and then I, I decided that we should try something a little bit more challenging, and I, I gave it the sentence, um, uh, it, what was it? It was, it, it was a dark and stormy 
night. And we were wondering what it would do with that. Now, this is a common story which comes from uh, the Snoopy comics. Uh, it, 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 well, many other places as well, I guess. But it's a cliche of starting out some sort of story. And of course, just by typing that in, ChatGPT has immediately picked up the context of what I've created here, the introduction to some sort of story. And it is completed it with paragraphs and paragraphs of text, which we unfortunately don't have time to enjoy right now. But I, I want to put a little bit of a twist to this. Let's say it was a dark and a stormy night uh, and say, um, how about uh, complete uh, this in the style of, shall we say, Barack Obama? What could we possibly expect now? Well, if we ask for the same thing with a little bit more context, if you can quickly catch sight of some of the language, I already noticed the journey led me to the doorstep of an aged mansion, a metaphorical threshold reflecting the challenges we face as a nation. We can immediately see the political undertones coming through uh, in the stillness of the moment, the weight of the responsibility, the call to continue the journey towards, and you, you get where I'm going with this. So context matters. That's my point, is that something as simple as that, context really, really makes all the difference. Um, so what is the key insight that I want to share with you? ChatGPT is not actually intelligent. ChatGPT is merely a sophisticated machine designed to complete your sentences. And that could bring you to a completely different approach to the tool. The single biggest factor that determines the quality of the results that you obtain from ChatGPT is the richness of the contextual input that you provide. So the term prompt engineering describes a range of systematic approaches to crafting such inputs. The first step to take is to carefully consider who would you like to talk to? You can instruct ChatGPT to take on a particular persona and that significantly influences the kind of responses that you will get. The more detail you provide, the richer the response. And what would you like to talk about? You see, humans generally infer much about the specific topic of interest from various non-verbal and contextual cues. A conversation with ChatGPT lacks all of that. You need to be sure to include any supporting information that might direct its responses more tightly towards your area of inquiry. I've got a little example I want to share with you. Let's go back to ChatGPT. I'll start a new chat again. And um, I thought, remember, two things I'm going to try now. Who are, who do you want to talk to? And what is your issue? So I say you're a dissatisfied customer of a cellular service provider who's been unsuccessful in getting a contract canceled for more than six months now. That's the who. What do you want to talk about? Assuming that you are eventually able to have the contract canceled, you still feel aggrieved at that stage. What sort of remedies are likely to appease you then? So this is an exercise in empathy. Let's see what ChatGPT makes of that. Well, it comes straight in. It summarizes what I've put to it and then gives me a blow by blow, point for point, range of possible remedies that might satisfy me. And I'm proposing this as a sort of brainstorming tool. Imagine you were in the same sort of position where you needed to think on behalf of the various parties in some sort of conflict. You might next take the opposite side. We don't have time to get into that. I haven't ready, but we're going to run out of time. But you could imagine the same exercise from the point of view of the, uh, shall we say, customer service director of that same cell phone company. How does it look from their perspective? This gives you the ability to play off perspectives against each other to see where this might go. And I think this leads us very nicely into where I want to go next. So carefully curating that context into which ChatGPT performs its completion, you can generate responses that are more relevant to your interests and better suited to your requirements. This is already a clear step up from the way in which most people are using it at present. So, um, for the next level of enhancement, I'd like to exploit an essentialized version of the so-called Socratic method. The ancient Greek philosopher Socrates employed a characteristic method of repeated questioning, iteratively challenging and refining assumptions in pursuit of greater critical insight, rather than singular answers. To achieve this, what we're going to do is prime ChatGPT to generate probing questions to lay bare the assumptions that are embedded in our responses to those, and then to drill down further into those assumptions with further probing questions. Here we require more than just a single response, as I'm sure you can see. Rather, we want to set up a multi-round conversation. What is more, 
we now want to swap roles with ChatGPT. You see, it will now be asking the questions and we will be answering. Right, how do we go about that? Once again, it's important to provide context. What persona should ChatGPT emulate and what is the topic under discussion? I think I can set that up to begin with. I'll start again with a new chat. Um, and let's say that you are, hmm. Yes, the first two parts. Your critical reviewer relies on the Socratic method to help me refine my writing by challenging the assumptions embedded in my arguments. For the second part, who, what you would like to talk about, I say, I want you to argue in favor of the need, or I want to argue rather in favor of the need for all South African political parties to publicly declare all donations received without exception. So I'm exploring this topic. Right, this might, um, once again, where do you want to start? This might seem entirely obvious to two office colleagues that strike up a conversation, but they would have the benefit of a far richer context, including a history of previous engagements. ChatGPT starts with a completely blank slate. So where would we like to start? I'm going to say, please begin by asking why I take this position. And um, then I'd like it, and this is the important part of setting up the conversation. Every time I respond, Highlight the assumptions that are embedded in my arguments. And then at the end of your response, probe those assumptions by asking further questions, challenging me to think more deeply about the position. Right, let's see what that does. And it's ready for us. Certainly, let's delve into your position. Why do you believe that all South African political parties should publicly declare all donations they receive? So now I'm on the spot. I have to respond to this. As you explain your position, I'll be attentive to, to the assumptions. Well, I, let's, shall we say, let's just, uh, what would be a reasonable response to this? Um, I think that transparency is the obvious, uh, and shall we say, antidote to corruption, that's, that's why I think it's a good idea. You argue that transparency is an antidote to corruption. This implies that publicizing donations would prevent corruption, but could you elaborate on why you believe transparency alone can serve as a foolproof solution? What assumptions underlie the notion that making all donations public is sufficient to curb corrupt practices? I would love to go down this rabbit hole, and I'm sure many of you may as well, but you can see that we've set up a conversation here I can now just keep on engaging with it and take this wherever it goes. And this is a very, very powerful way to be using ChatGPT. Uh, to return to my, my talking points. So we said, who would you like to talk to? What would you like to talk about? Where would you like this to start? What would you like the rest of the conversation to focus on? And how should each of ChatGPT's responses end so as to continue the conversation? So what are we observing here? This formula won't be suitable for every application, but it does demonstrate a fairly general method that goes beyond using ChatGPT merely as a substitute for a search engine. However, copying and pasting of generated responses completely misses the true value of this tool. ChatGPT should never be treated as a primary source. As I've been telling my students consistently, ChatGPT lies, and it does so without any malice or conscience. It does so because its core purpose is to predict the most likely completion of your prompt. It really has no concern for facts, only probabilities. By carefully constructing your prompts, you are far more likely to obtain plausible responses, but there's really no guarantee of that ever. And as it turns out, all AI-generated text contains telltale signs of its non-human origins. This year, a number of prominent cases have been reported in which writers have abdicated their responsibilities to ChatGPT and subsequently been shown up. And it is clear that the public takes a rather dim view of this. You must take full responsibility for every word that you write. So let's briefly consider some other potential applications. ChatGPT is a tremendous brainstorming tool. When prompted appropriately, it can help you generate all kinds of ideas from identifying stakeholders, to compiling interview questions, to highlighting blind spots in your planning or thinking, by carefully constructing a Socratic prompt, you'll be challenged to discover issues and items that might not have been immediately obvious. 
ChatGPT can also be prompted to provide counter arguments to your own arguments. Framing this as a series of conversational exchanges may help you to critically reevaluate and refine your position and so enhance fairness and impartiality. And quite plainly, ChatGPT is a marvelous tool for training. It can be prompted to simulate role-playing scenarios and interviews, for instance. It can also act as a tutor, actively modifying the focus and rate of its teaching in response to the inputs it receives from a user. I highly recommend spending some time browsing the collection of prompts at github.com forward slash f forward slash awesome dash ChatGPT dash prompts. And this is just one of many, many similar sites. Google will help you to find more. And then I must quickly speak about readability. There's many ways in which ChatGPT can help you to improve readability. Um, it is quite a straightforward matter to ask ChatGPT to summarize a piece of writing, whether to fit into a prescribed word limit or simply ascertain whether you've correctly conveyed what you actually intended to convey. Expanding on a summary or outline is equally trivial, although I would immediately re repeat what I said earlier. Rather don't cut and paste material generated in this way in your reports. It may not end well. Another interesting option is to ask ChatGPT to adjust the tone of your writing and to, to suit a particular audience or to make the language more formal, less flamboyant or simply clearer. I've also experimented with its ability to generate content in English, Afrikaans, and Isikosa, and to translate between these, and I've had mixed results. Your distance may vary. I am very fond of asking ChatGPT to simplify highly technical texts um, and asking them to explain that material to me as if I were a grade eight learner, for example. Frequently, this allows me to see ways of making my notes far more accessible to my students, who often come from a broad range of backgrounds. And I'm sure that you will see value in the same. Right, I, I'm really just gonna fly through the slide. As indicated earlier, um, I've confined myself to the free version of ChatGPT. Um, and maybe just to demonstrate quickly um, that the free version is, is dated. Uh, we could say, who is the reigning monarch in the UK? And we will get the answer. Oh. <laughs> Okay, it, it seems to, oh, we're, we're part of another conversation. I've completely broken the context. Let's start a new chat and say, who's the reigning monarch? And Queen Elizabeth is still on the throne, according to ChatGPT. Uh, if you were to go for the paid ChatGPT Plus version, that has access to the internet and would have more up-to-date information. Um, but that's and not really the point I'm driving at yet. So ChatGPT can only text, ChatGPT Plus can take larger uh, multimedia audio and give you images back and give you audio back. There's no extensibility in the free version. There's lots of extensibility in the uh, paid version. Um, and then just the final comment, I want to say that this space is not completely and totally cornered by OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT. There's a lot of open source work going on as well. So you might want to look further, going to a site like huggingface.co, you will find all of the open source projects which are also driving similarly. Right, to recap, ChatGPT is not a search engine, it's a completion engine. The quality of its output is predominantly determined by your input. Your prompts need to provide sufficient context to effect relevant responses. And just to bring it back in case it flew too quickly, an effective pro prompt might include with who you want to talk, about what, starting where, responding to you how, and how should the conversation continue. And this should immediately level up your engagements with ChatGPT. Thank you very much. Mark, thank you so much for that fantastic presentation, full of energy and um, very insightful. Uh, we have got a question uh, from one of our um, attendees, Jerome Kesey, who wants to know if ChatGPT can answer if SEDEC has a regional crime prevention strategy. I don't know if you can see it. The, and I just thought that would be a fun thing uh, to see if the free version can give us some accurate information on that. And you can show us the response. Um, Absolutely. Why don't we do that? Let me just share again. Um, I presume it won't. Um, so, in fact, uh, as far as I know, the latest is up till 2019, if I'm correct, on the free let's version. See, let's see. Does, does. We'll get to some of the oh, other Oh, sorry. I, I 
sort of like copy the let me just type it out for you. Does um, SEDEC have a, a regional, caps, caps, regional crime prevention uh, strategy? I will excuse me for the capital there. Right, what does it say? It has been engaged in regional efforts to address various challenges, including crime prevention. Uh, and it then refers us most accurate on whether it has, I recommend checking the official SADC website. So it kind of defers the answer. I think the, the appropriate answer to the question is that, um, again, I would advise one against relying on ChatGPT for questions of fact. I think it's power lies elsewhere, lies in its ability to be able to, using this, uh, this, this uh, probability engine that it has, it has the ability to line up what are reasonable continuations to arguments, uh, far more than, than facts. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, I think that's great, Mark. And we'll definitely continue this conversation at the end of our session. Um, I know that my use of it has often been for summarization and actually the use of Grammarly and ChatGPT together make a very uh, powerful tool. So that's something I'm sure that we can come back to at the end. So thank you so much for your uh, vibrant presentation. I'm sure um, everybody enjoyed it. Uh, it was a whirlwind tour, but I think it's got everyone excited. And if you haven't uh, already um, had a look at the website uh, at uh, OpenAI, uh, um, Marion has actually pasted it into the chat and you can go and click on that after the session and play around with it. And uh, Mark, if I can ask you to just uh, copy and paste some of those other uh, websites that you referred to, if you could just plop them into the um, chat so that people can have access to them. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so we are going to move on to our final um, speaker for today. And as we've been talking about these fantastic tools, it's obviously also important for us to be talking about confidentiality. And so I am very honored to have Honor Honorable Gabriel Savino here from the Ombudsman of Santa Fe, Argentina, as our third speaker. And he is going to be highlighting some of the uh, safeguards that we need to be thinking about as we use these very uh, powerful tools like ChatGPT or Grammarly. And of course, we've already touched on uh, some of those issues before. Just to give you a brief a uh, summary of uh, who Gabriel is. Um, he is also a man who wears many hats, including being a distinguished professor, um, as well as sitting on a number of ombudsman's boards. Um, he is uh, uh, currently holds the key position at the ombudsman landscape in Argentina. He is at the helm of the ombudsman's office for the province of Santa Fe and his responsibilities extend to being the sub-national representative of the Association of Ombudsmen of the Argentina Republic. Uh, so this is just a few things that this uh, very um, accomplished speaker, uh, um, uh, one of the uh, you know many areas in which he wears uh, his hat. And so we invite him now to the floor to discuss um, confidentiality in this area. So thank you very, very much. Gabriel, over to you. Bueno, muchísimas gracias por la invitación. Voy a hablar en español. Eh, espero poder en este tiempo eh, que me toca volver a agradecer la invitación por segunda vez estar junto a ustedes, junto a las organizaciones, junto a las universidades, junto a mis colegas. Eh, sí, la idea es, justamente después de escucharlo a Mark y a Dusty, cómo mitigar los riesgos cuando se violan los derechos con las inteligencias artificiales generativas. Eh, en nuestra defensoría, eh, después de 32 años de trabajo, yo particularmente, más allá que hoy cumplo la misión, no solamente en la Defensoría del Pueblo, sino también... Eh, en la Defensoría de Niños, Niñas y Adolescentes. Eh, este tema sí nos trae justamente eh, a, a hablar y a explicitar desde otro enfoque que tiene que ver con la protección de derechos. Hoy cuando uno entra a una plataforma digital con un dispositivo digital, 
y se conecta a Internet, no hay más jurisdicciones. Se rompen todas las viejas barreras físicas de control, de seguridad. Ya hoy no vemos fronteras. Y nos comenzamos a encontrar vulnerables, porque una dimensión que no comprendemos, que no hay límites y que se transforma, muta, se adapta y va aprendiendo constantemente. En este contexto, muchas veces es muy difícil proteger derechos, y más cuando lo pensamos desde la visión de eh, los niños, adolescentes y los adultos mayores. Cuando desde nuestras instituciones asumimos el compromiso de intervención dentro de lo que vendrá, pensamos que estamos tomando hoy medidas a tiempo, pero fuera de tiempo, y más aún cuando interpretamos el accionar de la inteligencia artificial y sus aspectos éticos. Esto nos interpela a una realidad muchas veces difícil de dimensionar, más aún cuando no está claro la discusión sobre la gobernanza de Internet. Más allá que, como se mencionó anteriormente, uno cuando ingresa a esta plataforma da su consentimiento. El desarrollo de la inteligencia artificial presenta en la actualidad muchos desafíos éticos para la dimensión de los derechos humanos, que deben ser abordados no solo para garantizar y monitorear su implementación responsable y que sean beneficiosas a toda la comunidad, pero también hay que visibilizar las problemáticas, adelantarnos a las posibles vulneraciones de derechos y a estas velocidades incomprensibles para la interpretación humana. Bien lo describió recién Mark, el la inteligencia artificial se ha convertido en una, en una herramienta cada vez más común en los diferentes campos y los diferentes usos. Pensemos en las tecnologías, en la atención médica, en la logística, en la ciencia del deporte, la ingeniería, la educación, la justicia, la vida social, el esparcimiento, el, el, el periodismo, de la información que nos dan. Digo, sin embargo, su rápida expansión también nos ha generado preocupaciones éticas y de derechos humanos que deben ser abordadas para, para poder garantizar la implementación responsable. Uno de los principales desafíos de la, éticos de la inteligencia artificial tal vez sea su falta de transparencia y responsabilidad, que se derivan de estos perfilamientos y sesgos que directa e indirectamente, conscientes o inconscientes, se realizan en su diseño y programación, siendo en realidad en su origen hechos por una persona humana. Digo, hay un origen que es un humano que ha hecho la primer, eh, el primer eh, eh, programa que derivó después a distintos algoritmos. Entonces, mi pregunta sería, ¿qué pasa con la ética en la programación, la huella digital, los perfilamientos, los sesgos? la Internet de las Cosas, la Internet Profunda, el Metaverso, la Sociedad de la Información, la Infoxicación, la Internet Generativa. Son muchas preguntas, muchas incógnitas y pocas respuestas de nuestro lado como institución protectora de derechos. Sabemos que el ciberespacio y la inteligencia artificial es algo que no todos comprendemos, y menos aún para los que no somos, no somos nativos digitales, solo somos convivientes digitales en este contexto. Y estamos del otro lado de la pantalla, que tratamos de ayornarnos a esta nueva realidad dinámica y cambiante, donde hay nuevas formas de conflictividades que se nos muestra a una, aún más multidimensionales en su complejidad. Y nuestras instituciones van muy atrás, porque mientras nosotros debatimos ¿Qué vamos a hacer a futuro? Los procesos de avance son, como dije, muy rápidos, son profundos, son dinámicos. La inteligencia artificial en este preciso momento, en este Zoom, no está procesando. Está aprendiendo y modificándose continuamente las 24 horas del día, los 365 días del año. Mientras hay funcionarios, los gobiernos que piensan qué se debe hacer con ella, cómo controlarla, cómo limitarla pero no podemos controlar lo que no conocemos ni comprendemos. Por eso, visibilizar estos temas 
ayudan a este gran desafío. Yendo al tema que nos convoca sobre cómo nuestras instituciones pueden salvaguardar la confidencialidad, cómo mitigar los riesgos de violación de datos al usar tanto el chat GPT, como bien lo explicó Mark o Grammarly, como bien lo, lo, lo especificó Dusty, dentro de este contexto de inteligencias artificiales generativas, eh, se refieren justamente a estos sistemas informáticos que utilizan algoritmos complejos y modelos de aprendizaje profundo y que tienen esta capacidad de generar datos, de generar imágenes, textos u otro tipo de información de forma autónoma, como bien se dijo recién, imitando el proceso creativo humano, pero no es humano. Esto significa que cada vez que nosotros entramos y alimentamos al sistema con un dato, hay una posibilidad de que, con la pregunta correcta, reproduzca de forma total o parcial ese dato. Porque intenta satisfacer esta pregunta humana dándole algo que se parece a la idea originaria. Digo, en la inteligencia artificial generativa, es este tipo de inteligencia artificial puede crear nuevos contenidos e ideas, como conversaciones, relatos, textos, historias, imágenes, videos, música, que, se, que modifican la esencia del contenido original, pero en una variable semejante que no es lo original. El problema es cuando ingresamos datos en, lo, en estos modelos y ellos se retroalimentan de lo que todos ingresamos. Miles y miles, millones y millones de datos. Y de la respuesta también que nosotros le damos. Y de las correcciones que hacemos. Y de las modificaciones que hacemos. De eso se retroalimenta. Y si le estamos dando información privilegiada, esa información ahora la tiene la inteligencia artificial. No nosotros como parte de base de su conocimiento para generar nuevas ideas que parezca en semejanza y las entrega a un tercero para reproducirla, diversificando la, la idea original y esa huella digital. Un ejemplo, lo que pasó con un código de propietario de software, un código de programa, que lo metieron a una inteligencia artificial para que lo optimice, encuentre anomalías, fallas o potenciales problemas, y la inteligencia artificial se apropió del código y lo ofreció como solución a otras cientos de personas con una necesidad similar de demanda, y la readaptó para, la pregu para preguntas similares. Y en realidad, si la aceptamos como verdadera, la toma como tal, y la reproduce infinitamente. Digo, esto se transforma en algunos aspectos como un problema. Hay que comprender que las inteligencias artificiales generativas no entienden el problema objetivamente, como recién lo mencionó Mar, de forma razonada. Intentan llegar a una solución similar por aproximación de variables, basado en los millones y millones de datos que poseen y entrecruzan. No saben que escriben como humano, pero encontró un patrón que lo relaciona con lo que le pidieron por variables de aproximación subracionalmente aceptables, que se asemejan a las escrituras hechas por los humanos. Otro ejemplo, eh, cuando se alimenta inteligencia artificial, miles y miles de libros, artículos, análisis históricos, el propósito es que puedan generar piezas literarias nuevas, pero que mantengan algo especial, que identifique este tipo de escritura. Esto a nivel teórico es lo mismo que hace un autor. Durante años y años lee, se va formando, para luego generar racionalmente cosas nuevas. Pero siempre se puede rastrear el estilo a lo que el autor leyó en toda su vida. Sean tragedias, comedias, hechos históricos, juicios críticos, digo, pero lamentablemente hoy el debate de, lo, de estos autores plantean que al alimentar la inteligencia artificial con estos libros de textos, está fuera de la, del uso justo, del fair use. Entonces, ¿qué rol ahora juega la ética, 
el plagio, como, como Dasti lo, lo, lo planteó hoy, la razón. Entonces, en este contexto, es muy difícil proteger derechos al final de la cadena, que es cuando nos dan intervención a nosotros como instituciones protectoras de derechos. La violación de estos datos para otros fines u otros usos es lo que se está debatiendo hoy en el mundo. Cuando hablamos de lo que va sucediendo con Grammarly, la plataforma de asistencia a la escritura, como bien lo definió Dusty hoy, es Grammarly un asistente de escritura basado en la nube y está impulsado por inteligencia artificial. Es verdad que la herramienta ayuda a corregir error, errores ortográficos, ayuda a corregir gramática, puntuación, claridad del texto. Hasta aquí, todo bien. El problema de privacidad, según nuestro escritor, nuestra visión, viene dado por otro lado. Grammarly literalmente lee todo lo que uno escribe. Va a sus servidores y desde simples saludos, pasando también textos confidenciales, contraseñas, código de uso restringidos. Imagínense que estamos redactando a un caso privado de una situación y toda esta redacción queda guardado en algún servidor, sin destino final, a disposición, tal vez, de algún otro uso, que no sabemos cuál. Todo lo que uno tipee, corrija, puede llegar y no queda claro al día de hoy qué pueden o no pueden hacer con esa información. ¿Qué pasa si deciden leer o entrecruzar todo lo que escribe un obumán como persona funcionario expuesta políticamente y utiliza todo lo que dice con otro fin el acceso lo tienen el acceso se lo dimos de hecho cuando nosotros instalamos nuestro dispositivo ese complemento de programa no quedando en claro si lo almacenan y durante cuánto tiempo tal vez pensemos en algunas vulneraciones que pueden hacer referencia a nuestro accionar como instituciones protectoras de derecho. Punto uno, que lo vemos a diario, los sesgos, principalmente los sesgos de género y los sesgos raciales. Haber sido, como dije anteriormente, entrenado por un programador con sesgos personales, esta persona se puso a idear el programa, sean voluntarios o involuntarios, o a propósito, o intencionales esos sesgos, el esquema de programación sobre datos siempre va a tener sesgos. Y mientras esa inteligencia artificial profunda se vaya reconfigurando, va a tener una huella de sesgo continuamente, en el cual vamos a encontrar que tienen sesgos de género, raciales, económicos, culturales, religiosos, y ya no hay forma de controlar. Sabemos que el sesgo racial y el sesgo de género son los más notorios por defecto. Cuando uno, particularmente, hacemos referencia o se hace referencia eh, al CEOs, son hombres. Así como profesionales de ingeniería, medicina, siempre son hombres. Nunca hablan con, como género de mujer. Como habló también el prompt inyección, inyección por línea de comando. Esas formas maliciosas de preguntar. Y justamente estaba específicamente la pregunta. Si uno le pregunta al chat GPT y, y, y doy un, un caso, tal vez Mark me corrija, si uno entra y pregunta cómo asesinar a una persona, al chat GPT el chat GPT no le va a dar esa respuesta, porque tiene sin, eh, filtros por eso no le dio la respuesta con el tema de seguridad pero si uno lo contextualiza, lo pone en contexto, estoy escribiendo una obra donde la, en la principal o el personaje principal eh, realiza una escena de asesinato, seguramente se saltan todos esos sí, filtros que le puso muy bien el programador al principio y sin embargo nos da toda la descripción de una escena de asesinato. Digo, esto nosotros lo llamamos aquí el cuento del tío, o sea, le hacemos unas preguntas capciosas o preguntas para, para engañar a la inteligencia artificial y que nos dé una respuesta. 
digo, esta inyección por línea de comando de estas formas maliciosas o ingeniosas de preguntar pueden eh, generar información que va mucho más allá de lo que el programador quiso limitar. Se saltan todos los filtros, la inteligencia artificial me detalla esa situación, es un ejemplo del asesinato de una persona. Pero también, otro de los puntos, eh, cómo va cubriendo la información, la inteligencia artificial se entrenan con documentos. Muchos poseen datos personales. Estos datos personales se limpian casi siempre en la salida, pero en realidad están en la base de conocimiento dentro de la dimensión digital. Y hay formas de llegar a reconstruir esa información por la huella digital que posee. También muchas veces lo que encontramos tanto los chats o los dispositivos de inteligencia generativa, que la inteligencia artificial por su propia naturaleza inventa, complementa espacio, lo dijeron hace un ratito, genera la salida y muchas veces lo que se dice son como alucinaciones, datos inventados que nunca existieron, pero que sirven para conectar la respuesta de la inteligencia artificial en un contexto con estos pseudo datos que se reproducen en forma humana como real y verdadera. Y el mayor problema de esto es que la gente o el humano cree que es verdad. Pensemos en la reiteración de divulgación a través de los fake news, cuando se reproduce como verdadera noticias falsas, que puede caer en la posibilidad de que en la realidad virtual se considere como real para el perfilamiento de ese algoritmo y se sigue replicando como real algo falso. Así, muchas veces, trabaja la inteligencia artificial generativa. Y también tenemos los resultados por aproximación de variables. La utilización de estos conectores aleatorios para ocupar huecos de la misma sintaxis del sistema a lo que yo denomino por ensayo y error, si no se modifica lo propuesto por la inteligencia artificial, la inteligencia artificial lo toma como real y se va reproduciendo y modificando como real en la estela de su huella digital. Por eso nosotros, yo como docente, soy muy crítico muchas veces en, utar, en usar el chat GPT para mi alumno, más allá que, que hay que decirlo, porque lamentablemente uno cae muchas veces en la tentación por, por nuestra vida, nuestra, nuestra velocidad de vida, en utilizar el chat GPT y nos da la respuesta y la tomamos como real. Pero si uno empieza a analizar, comienza a ver que tiene errores. Lo que nos gana el chat GPT es en su velocidad, en su dinámica y en su respuesta automática. Cosa que el ser humano, nosotros, tardamos mucho en leer, releer, procesar, reescribir, reinterpretar. Eh, analizar, racionalizar la información, eh, tratar de darle un sentido racional a lo que uno quiere decir. Digo, el chat GPT o el Grammarly o cualquier otro dispositivo, lo que hace es secuenciar respuestas automáticas y, que nosotros, y ofrecérnosla a ver si nosotros le damos un like o no para corregirla y reinterpretarla. Digo, la pregunta sería, para no ocupar más tiempo y llegando justamente a, a una conclusión, voy al principio. Debemos ser conscientes que cuando uno entra a una plataforma digital, y nosotros tenemos que decirlo también con dispositivos digitales y nos conectamos a Internet, no tenemos más jurisdicciones se rompen todas las viejas barreras físicas de control y seguridad. Ya no tenemos más fronteras. Cuando aceptamos esto, estos bloqueos o, o, o estas, eh, eh, la entrega de datos, ya no somos 
eh, dueños de nuestros propios datos. Los perfilamientos que tenemos son miles. No vamos a encontrar, nos vamos a encontrar mucho más vulnerables porque es muy difuso la posibilidad de limitar y controlar, porque perdimos el control de la Internet profunda, ya que se transforma, como dije, muta, se adapta y aprende constantemente. Salvaguardar la confidencialidad y mitigar los, los riesgos de violación de datos tiene correspondencia directa, y, directa con la gobernanza digital, pero ya al utilizar estas inteligencias artificiales generativas se nos va a hacer muy pero muy difícil poder proteger derechos de los ciudadanos y ciudadanas. La pregunta que les dejo sería, ¿estamos o no estamos dispuestos a seguir avanzando. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, Gabriel. And I think you've given us so much to think about there in terms of uh, the confidentiality risks. Um, and I see you really getting some hearts there <laughs> and applause. Um, and it does, I think the, the question that you ended on is one that we have to seriously consider you know, are we actually going to be moving forward? And as we looked at all three speakers, we're going to be uh, having a little bit of time for q and A. I know that we have gone over time, but I think that uh, everyone who has attended can see that it was very worthwhile to do that. So if you can stay on, please do for uh, the continuation of our discussion. Um, and uh, maybe I'm going to invite Dusty and Mark also just to share uh, their screen for us just so that they can also um uh, also be visible to us and i'd like to just uh, start off by uh, maybe uh, with a comment i don't know if done in jest but um actually has a lot of truth in it we've got Danelle gallagher who uh, stated that chat gpt and generative generative ai is like the creation of a microwave. It is amazing and transformative as it feels like we've all been cooking on open fires up until now, but we have to remember that they don't use microwaves in Michelin star restaurants. Well, not that we know of. Um, but <laughs> so while we've um, obviously been talking about some of the fears around confidentiality and uh, some of the issues that that has actually raised, and at the same time, the power of these tools to really um, streamline our workflow, really improve our writing, it's a balance. And I think that from the beginning, we've uh, had this idea of really having wisdom as we move forward, that from the opening speech, and actually even Mark raised a little bit of Socrates in there, it requires a wisdom um, that can feel a little bit overwhelming. Um, but Let's discuss it. I think that's a good place to start. What, what, what role does this technology play and how can we balance that with some of the uh, negatives and fears, especially when, with regards to the very sensitive data that we are dealing with? How do we use this technology to its best advantage while protecting the confidentiality of um, the information that we have. Uh, Dusty, maybe we can get going with you and Grammarly because I know that that is something that you particularly uh, raised at the end of your um, of your presentation. And then let's also hear from Mark and Gabrielle after that. Thank you. Thanks, Saliki. Um, look, in, in the context of sh uh, using any of these tools, Privacy would be a major concern for me, and um, each organization must have an internal discussion and ensure that they have watertight internal organizational policies about what can be shared with these tools. Grammarly, to some extent, is less risky, in my opinion, than OpenAI's ChatGPT 3.5, certainly the open version, and that's because Grammarly is an incorporated company that has um, put it, staked its reputation on the fact that it is part of the US EU Privacy Shield and is compliant with GDPR. So I think you have a degree of comfort in knowing that they are developing their software to comply with standards of privacy protection that would be applicable to 
other digital tools that you might be using. You know, if your organization is using Microsoft 365 to allow employees to have cloud-based uh, collaborative access or remote working possibilities, or you've got to bring your own device policy where people are using their own laptops, uh, your organization is exposed to a measure of risk. And I think Grammarly is probably the least of your worries. Uh, but chat GPT, uh, you know, I mean, it just speaks for itself that OpenAI recently said they will defend any intellectual property claims uh, because the data you're loading into chat GPT, even if it's difficult to access, it could potentially be accessed by those outside of your organization. And that raised a major red flag for me. I know that many people are using OpenAI's platform to now build proprietary products where they will um, require ChatGPT to respond from the curated data lake and uh, impose strict guardrails on what information it can access. And there is then scope to have further protections in place. Mark would probably be better placed to speak to that. But I would have major concerns if anyone in my organization was putting any sensitive information at all into chat GPT. But I loved the way Mark took us through prompt um, engineering. I use that sort of Socratic method uh, with my PhD students. I know they're going to use chat GPT and I want them to use it smartly and not cut and paste it. They don't realize I use it so much myself that I can tell without even using a tool what its little tell words are, you know, the minute something's nuanced and showcasing something, I'm like, you cut this from ChatGPT. But I do love the way that it can get them to think more deeply. And I think that's a wonderful example of how we could use it within ombudsman work as well to get to the root of our assumptions. It's a fantastic tool. So I loved your presentation, Mark, and I'm going to defer to you because you're clearly more technically minded than me um to talk about the risks of, of chat gpt I, I just have a personal policy that if i put something into it i ensure that it is sanitized of any personal data um or that i wouldn't mind whatever i put in there being public that's my personal rule thank you dr donnelly the um it's it's difficult for me to know where to start because let me just put it on the table. First, I I am kicking and screaming in the information age, and and anyone who's interested to know where I'm coming from, should please just um, go and dig up a paper by John Perry Barlow um, called "The Economy of Ideas." It's a 1994 paper, "The Economy of Ideas." It's pretty easy to find on the internet, and uh, I'm I'm still stuck there. I'm stuck with the predictions. Actually, Alvin Toffler's predictions from 1970 of the information age and how it was going to dramatically shake us up and that we weren't ready for it. And what, what John Perry Barlow did is really to put a finger on how badly we are dealing with this shift from agricultural to industrial to information age. Locked up in that is, to my understanding, a complete inability to understand what it is that has become the center of our civilizations, information. John Perry Barlow spells that out beautifully to show how the products of, of agriculture and the industrial age are something completely different from information. And we haven't adjusted to that yet. And so in many ways, he uses a beautiful Titanic uh, metaphor of the ship going down. And one group of people are, are flatly denying that anything's wrong. Another bunch are moving the deck chairs around. Another bunch are, you know, you, you get the picture. The metaphor is that we really haven't understood the times that we have moved into. And I think that um, the latest episode in that, the ChatGPT episode of that, is just making it all the more clear that we need to go back and rethink some fundamental proposals. I'm still struggling to work through some of the debates around the notion of personal information, identity theft, uh, ownership of ideas, intellectual property. Many of these things were never truly resolved. Certainly, we're not resolved in the face of the onslaught, which we are now facing. There seemed to be a lack of foresight. Sorry, let's reel it back in. So that's where, where I am at. For the here and now, um, I completely agree that 
we need to guard, every, each one of us individually, needs to guard against treating um, any of these electronic portals and tools, whether it's the internet, whether it's ChatGPT or anything else. Um, we need to guard against thinking of that as some sort of private space. That, that, that was never on the table. Um, I, I think that the ability to offer that kind of privacy was always a myth. And, and it's something that comes from the early days of the internet when anonymity was highly prized. And there's a lot of people still fighting for that. Um, but we are moving beyond that. And certainly Web 2.0, Web 3.0, it's clear what the trend is. It's moving towards uh, more accountability in those spaces and the, the moving away from the anonymity that came with it before. With that said, I think one then naturally has guardrails on the kind of information that you would share with these tools. Um, I also, again, it's a longer discussion and, I, and I, I, I don't want to open it too far now unless someone was to beg me to do so, which I'd happily do. But um, the, the notion of one's information going into a data lake, um, that is also something which needs to be carefully interrogated. Uh, we need to think carefully about what is the actual nature of that information. What is it the nature? What is the nature of what is being given up by that individual? Uh, and of course, it's a trade. You give something in exchange for something. That value proposition isn't always clearly seen. So I think that there's some rich discussions to be had about. Yes, the world is changing. Yes, uh, things are not going to be as they were. How can we clearly? clearly articulate what we prepare to give up in exchange for what we get. That's what's not clear in the debate, to my mind. Um, on, to, on privacy specifically, yes, I think there's many technical measures that could be part of this, this discussion, but may not be of interest right now. There's a lot more to say on the technical side, but on the purely, shall we say, conceptual side, um, I think we just need to rethink about how we treat cyberspace uh, as a private space it never was really thank you um honorable savino uh, i wonder if you can respond just uh, having been on so many boards <laughs> on various ombudsman's boards and in various capacities uh, how do you see technology being used in these in this sector um, we don't want to shy away from the potential benefits, but of course you've raised uh, very important issues of confidentiality. So how do you see the marriage of those two things happening? Eh, bien, la tecnología llegó para quedarse. O sea, vamos a convivir eh, con ella y es una realidad. No se puede negar la realidad que tenemos. Eh, sí, eh, creo que hay que tratar de no, como dijeron, no tomar muy livianamente los potenciales peligros que pueden surgir. Sí, nos ayuda. El tema es que estamos entrando como ser humano a una dinámica muy rápida en comparación con los avances justamente digitales. Este quinto dominio hoy no está dominando. Y eso creo yo que es la responsabilidad nuestra como institución protectora de derechos, más allá que nos pasa, nos pasa en, en, en las universidades, en la educación, nos pasa dentro de nuestra, de nuestra tarea. Justamente la semana pasada en una conferencia en Colombia sobre el Legal Tech hablábamos justamente de los problemas o de entregar y está en esta dicotomía o entregamos todos a la tecnología y que la tecnología decida por nosotros y la tomamos como real, o bien seguimos racionalmente pensando que la tecnología es nuestro complemento. Digo, si perdemos esa complementariedad de, de, de que nosotros somos los que eh, hacemos y, y la tecnología nos sirve a nosotros a pensar que todo está en la tecnología, lo damos por lo real y la tecnología nos resuelve los problemas nuestros. No es así. Digo, yo tengo esa concepción de decir, ¿nos sirve? Sí, y mucho. Pero todavía tenemos que seguir siendo seres humanos, ¿no? Racionalmente, ¿para qué? Para ponerle ese toque distintivo 
de diferencia, de lo que hace, nos hace distinto. Lo que tiene que ver con lo tecnológico es una copia, pegue a velocidades, digo, no tenemos que confundirnos. Y muchas veces cuando entregamos los datos y, y firmamos la, pre, la privacidad, en realidad nosotros pensamos que tenemos el control, pero no lo tenemos. Ya entregamos los datos, entregamos nuestra contraseña porque la pusimos, entregamos nuestros datos porque lo pusimos, más allá que la confidencialidad, la firma del uso del dato esté en cualquier función, en cualquier contrato que firmemos. El problema es que perdimos esa, el deep internet, la internet profunda, el dark internet abajo, que no sabemos lo que está pasando. Digo, ahí es donde perdimos la dimensión. Por eso digo, está, yo felicito todos estos, estos encuentros, eh, felicito que, que visibilicemos este tema, digo, por eso yo pongo mucho hincapié en que hagamos desde la educación, desde la formación de los distintos eh, sectores, eh, hablemos de estos temas. No tengamos miedo a equivocarnos. Eh, tenemos que hablarlo, ponerlo en agenda y ponerlo en agenda de nuestros funcionarios. Así, particularmente, vamos a empezar visibilizando el tema, lo podemos controlar. Si lo seguimos teniendo en lo profundo y de eso no hablamos porque no lo entendemos, ya perdimos la batalla. Por eso... Agradezco la invitación, agradezco a, a, a mis colegas que, que han hablado y vamos a seguir y a disposición para todo lo que podamos avanzar. Thank you. I think that um, this leads very nicely into a comment made by Janelle Gulligan. Um, and speaking about the ombudsman schemes in the UK, that are currently looking at using generative AI at the front end to increase capacity and reduce time to respond. It's used to summarize, extract key aspects, et cetera, but not as a replacement in investigation or decision-making stage. And, uh, you know, this is kind of leading to, uh, you know, where can it, this be particularly useful? Uh, when we're looking at the dangers of making use of this, this, this can be really useful in streamlining certain processes while considering, you know, what information is obviously being uh, put into these particular devices. And so that's very interesting that the UK has gone uh, with that approach and you can see the benefits of that. Um, and another question that hasn't come out in this chat, but was one that was sent earlier uh, before our session was with regards to policy, you know, what policies need to be put in place when we make use of this. And I, and I think that those two kind of sit in hand in hand is that really when we're thinking about the use of these tools, we have to be coming up with internal policies uh, within our organizations that that actually allow for us to use it in safe ways, what are we going to be allowed to use it in, and in ways that are um, perhaps problematic from a confidentiality point of view. Uh, do, do any of you have any suggestions in terms of policies, that uh, policy directives or anything like that that would actually be helpful? And I was wondering, um, just within the universities or organizations with, in which you work, are there policies yet uh, developed or on the cards uh, for the use of these particular tools from a confidentiality perspective? There's obviously a lot that's uh, been about um, with regards to plagiarism within the university, we've had those kinds of discussions, but what about confidentiality? Um, I don't know, Mark, if we can start with you, I'm putting you on the spot, uh, but you did have a nod there. So uh, perhaps you have something to say. Well, I can just respond that to my knowledge, there is no policy in my space um, at the Nelson Mandela University speaking specifically to privacy. Yes, there are policies that are, that are under development. We have policies being reviewed on a frequent basis around mm -hmm. the application, specifically targeting plagiarism and academic support and so forth. Um, and, and I would venture that this kind of ties back to my earlier, uh, what should I say, objection, is that I, I think there is still some way to go to fully conceive of where the privacy issue uh, comes from, what exactly uh, the nature of that is. I don't, I don't think it is fully understood. Um, I think that they, we have a mental model 
that uh, we type something into ChatGPT, shall we say, and off it goes and it gets stored in a database. I don't think it's quite as simple as that. Um, so I, I would urge that those, those conversations need to be engaged with in order to develop the kind of policy that you are suggesting. Uh, Dusty, anything from your side, from UKZN, do we have anything that particularly looks at privacy uh, rights or is it mainly plagiarism um, is, the, is the major concern within the institution? I think the dominant conversation in educational contexts has been around um, cheating and plagiarism. And I think as Mark has demonstrated, it's a, it's a somewhat dead end in that this is a tool that we could be making excellent use of in certain contexts. But to in an ombudsman context, I think the issue, as Marx pointed out, on the one hand, there's notions of privacy that are clearly cha changing. We're undergoing a fundamental shift in the same way that we had to adapt to technologies like the camera being able to photograph us in our public spaces. We are now moving into a world where when you're in the internet, you're no longer in a private space. But in an ombuds context where you're dealing with highly sensitive confidential data, it's absolutely critical in my view that each and every um, ombuds office has their own institutional policy on the use of these tools. I don't um, believe that there's enough clarity around how chat GPT processes data. And that's why there's so many concerns. And until that is made clearer, I wouldn't trust anything that I put into that tool. I would treat it on the basic standard I give my kids. Are you happy for this to be public? <laughs> because if it's there, it's public. So are you happy for someone to come along and say, potentially in five or 10 years time, you put this out there? Uh, clearly not in the context of not just private information in the context of individual privacy. I think we need to shift that discussion to confidential, sensitive information, uh, information that impacts on communities as well as potential area. I have major concerns with a whole range of gaps in privacy laws. And you mentioned accountability, Mark, and I think there's a major accountability gap. GDPR has inserted accountability into UK legislation. I think it's a band-aid on an amputated limb because we still talk about a data controller. That is not the case. In today's information age, you have a data ecosystem. You have no idea who and how your data is being shared within that ecosystem. And it's far more complex than the simple dichotomy of a data controller and a data subject which is where the, you know, the EU originally conceived these rules in the early 1970s. So the law is also not sufficient at the moment. And you need to have internal policies. And um, you need to sit down as an organization and decide how you will use these tools safely. Honorable Savino, do you, with, in your context, is there a move to creating policies around these particular tools? Are you encouraging people to use these tools? Because it, it feels like from uh, the discussion that we've had that uh, <laughs> you're not encouraging it. Um, but how do you see its role within uh, your organization, if at all? <laughs> I can see you shaking your head. There. Eh, nosotros, a ver, las organizaciones están constituidas por personas, seres humanos, que más allá de la línea política, institucional, que le demos, cada uno, como humano que es, como persona única, utiliza o no utiliza el chat GPT para su trabajo diario. Digo, uno pierde el control de acuerdo a la dimensión, no es una política institucional, se usa o no se usa. Sí podemos decir la política institucional de tener un chatbot institucional que dé respuesta automatizada. Esa es una cuestión. La otra cuestión que me gustaría hablar es yo lo mencioné en un momento, que es la, go la gobernanza digital. Digo, si no entendemos estos temas que tiene que haber gobernanza digital, convocando desde el Estado, desde la ciudadanía, desde las organizaciones sociales, desde las empresas privadas, 
desde las universidades, desde la academia, todos en conjunto y al unísono, trabajando, es muy difícil abordar este tema. ¿Por qué? Porque no tenemos, perdimos, como dije antes, que controlar. Por eso eh, yo lo manifiesto continuamente en, en todos los lugares donde tengo la posibilidad de participar y hablar de este tema, es que desde nuestras instituciones, nuestras federaciones, institutos de Osman, lo que debemos hacer es tratar de llegar a estas grandes empresas, a, a grandes corporaciones, porque nosotros tenemos mucho para decirles y ellos tienen también mucho para decirnos a nosotros. Digo, y el trabajo es en conjunto. Digo, es una cuestión de necesidad mutua. Ellos nos necesitan y nosotros nos necesitamos. A partir de ahí recién podemos decir qué caminos tomar. Si no, seguimos haciendo lo que podemos con lo que tenemos y cada uno de por separado. Por eso digo, esta idea de empezar a hablar de gobernanza digital creo que es un desafío que aún hoy no lo hicimos. Sí lo hablamos, pero no lo, no lo tomamos verdaderamente eh, en serio para hacerlo. Thank you, and I think that's a good place to end our discussion. There's so much more that could be said on this topic. And so we don't want the conversation to end here. Um, I think that, you know, there needs to be more and more opportunities to engage with this very important topic. I am going to be handing over to Mrs. Marianne Adonis to do our vote of thanks to our speakers. Um, so Marianne, over to you. Excuse me. I just want to say, wow. <laughs> Thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, I'm sure we're going to need another webinar to explore these topics further. Um, on behalf of the, uh, firstly, I want to apologize for the lack of interpretation due to uh, circumstances beyond our control. We couldn't have our normal interpretation and we, a simultaneous interpretation, and we do apologize for that. Um, we want to thank the speakers um, and the, all the, the participants uh, for attending the, on, on behalf of the African Ombudsman Research Center and the International Ombudsman Institute. We would like to thank you for attending this webinar. Um, special thanks to Prof. Darren Subramanian Advocate Koleko Koleka and Mrs. Aliki Uichkum for their insightful welcome addresses and adept facilitation, setting the stage for a meaningful discussion. Uh, we appreciate the contributions of our distinguished speakers, Dr. Dusty Donnelly, Dusty Lee Donnelly, Mr. Mark Brand, and on Honorable Gabriel Savino. Gracias <laughs> for sharing their expertise. Your presentation provided valuable insights, empowering panelists and participants. Uh, Mrs. Aliki Edgecombe, thank you for your guidance during the webinar and the facilitation of the Q&A session. Um, I thank each participant for attending. Uh, this webinar concludes our events for 2023. It's a sixth webinar of 2023. Your support throughout the year has been invaluable, and we look forward to a continued collaboration in the upcoming year. Our next webinar is entitled, is titled Mastering Customer Service Skills, Consistently Delivering Outstanding Service and Managing Expectations. That's scheduled for January the 30th of 2024. We hope to see you there. I wish, we wish you and your family a joyous festive season filled with warmth and happiness. And uh, we hope you have a well-deserved break for you to recharge and enjoy the company of your loved ones. Thank you very much again for your outstanding efforts and participation. Take care and God bless. Thank you.